we're doing is we're picking right back up on what we left off, where we left off of last uh, video. Um, and we're talking about here how attention can influence physiological responding. And this example that I used was one that uh, was with a human in fMRI. So I'm going to give you guys another example of how attention can influence physiological responding. And in this case, I'm going to use an example of a, a Bossman's ex, uh, experiment where they actually used monkeys. So we know that um, <clears throat> it's not only important to look at the size of the physiological response, but what's really important is the relationship between the responses, between the areas of the brain. And so when uh, in, in, in um, local field potential is a response that you can actually um, test by taking an electrode and placing it on the brain and then what ends up happening is you can actually get electrical signals from clusters of neurons and this usually means about a thousand, you know, th several thousand neurons and so what you're able to do is get these electrical signal signals and you can see the patterns of firing of those groups of neurons and how um, closely related they are in terms of the size of the relationship as well as the distance and um, how how synchronous those different groupings are. And so with this particular experiment, um, the uh, what, what they were interested in was coherence. So a measure of coherence is just how synchronized the signals are. And in this case, there's a monkey looking at um, having a fixation point, which is that, you know, where you see it's looking right here, this um, kind of blue dot. And then there's uh, stimuli, uh, two different kind of stimuli. There's stimulus one and stimulus two. And then these recording sites are really important. So A and B are in the V1, um, the uh, occipital cortex, and the uh, location C is in the temporal cortex. And what they wanted to see was not necessarily the size of the amount of firing, but the relationship between the different sites um, of the electrode placements, so there were different recording sites. So for this first one right here, you can see that um, in this particular example, the um, monkey was not uh, attending to stimulus one. Um, so here, no attention to stimulus one. And these are the site, these are the, uh, electrode electrical signals from sites A and from site C. And so as you can see, they're not synchronous. They're not working together. Um, the, you know, monkey is not attending to, uh, stimulus one. Now, when we look at this one right here, looking at these uh, local field potentials here with this these different electro placements what we can see is that <clears throat> the responses recorded in a and in c actually become synchronous while the monkey is actually attending to um this stimulus to stimulus one and so what's important here is not the size of the relationship uh, uh, it's not the size of the responses, but the fact that they're synchronous. And you can actually see that they're actually lining up very close together in terms of um, their, uh, the electrical impulse. And so <clears throat> we know that the uh, attention is, uh, in, in, in this case of the monkey actually attending to stimulus one, this attention enhances the communication between the neurons in these two different sites. And we know that this communication and this relationship is actually resulting in them uh, synchronizing and demonstrating similar patterns of firing. And so, you know, this is something that's really interesting to see how attention can influence this, you know, particular response pattern. Now, when we look at <clears throat> how we put it all together, we talk about something called binding. So binding is when we take all the little pieces of something and we put it all together into something that we perceive. So f the example I'm going to use here is the example of a rolling ball. So here we have a red ball. Now, the ball is red, it's circular, um, circular, it's moving, right? Um, there's all these different features that we have as smooth, right? All, uh, all these different features that we have to think about 
in reference to just this very simple rolling ball. And so when we consider this, we have to think about how is it that we're able to take all of those features and put them together into one coherent picture. And so this brings us to the binding problem, and that is how are we able to take all these different features and put them together into one coherent object and one coherent image? And the binding problem is we know that there are different elements that are in the brain that we know are responsible for seeing different features. For example, the smoothness, the fact that it's round, the way that the lines are oriented, the color, the motion, all these different features of the ball are housed in different areas of the brain. The brain. So how is it that we're able to put this all together and actually see a rolling ball? How is it that we're so very easily able to take all of this information and put it together. And so here, for example, we have, you know, the area in the brain here that's responsible for location and space of where this ball is, is in terms of the, the table, the depth, the motion of the ball moving this way, the fact that it's red, the form, all of these different things are actually, you know, something that we have to consider that all gets put together in, in, you know, in these very different areas of the brain. And that leads to us viewing a rolling ball. How is it that we're able to do this? So <clears throat> one potential explanation is something called the feature integration theory. Now the feature integration theory, we're going to go into this in, um, in some detail here, uh, is a theory that um, is trying to explain how we're able to get all these individual features into one coherent same object. And so the idea behind feature integration theory is that it's broken up into two major stages. So we have the pre-attentive stage, which is the stage where we actually see all the features of the object um, in in separated form. And so the pre-attentive phase is that all the pieces are there before we focus on the actual object. And so because this is something that's very quick, something that happens before attention, we consider this as something that's unconscious, that's extremely fast. It's something that is effortless. It's something that we do not have to actually uh, try to do. It's automatic. Once we go through this pre-attentive stage and we see all the little features of the object, it then moves to the focused attention stage. And that's when, that's the next step to where we actually see that the features are combined and we see it as a coherent thing. So first step is there's an object, we move to the pre-attentive stage, which is effortless, automatic, and these features are completely separated out. So, you know, we're talking about color, we're talking about shape, we're talking about, you know, motion, we're talking about all these tiny little elements you know, the smoothness, all these itty bitty little features that make up that object. And then it moves to this focused attention stage where we combine all of these together to equal to a rolling ball, right? Um, and that gives us that perception of what we're seeing. So <clears throat> a way for us to look at this is to do experiments where we try to figure out if we are in fact seeing things as separate items and then do we then put them together as a next step. So an illusory conjunction is one that um, is a, um, one that happens when we accidentally put features together conjunction just meaning combination in the wrong way. And so if I were to give you, let's say I was going to give you a red triangle. Okay. And I give you a blue circle. Okay. And I give you a green square and I give this to you and I say, okay, I want you to remember these different things. If you accidentally tell me that you saw a blue triangle, right? 
or a red circle, that's an illusory conjunction, okay? Um, you, you did not see this, you mixed this up. You mixed the color up with the shape and you actually didn't see a red trying, uh, you, you, you didn't realize what you saw was in fact a red triangle. You mixed it up and thought it was a red circle. You saw a blue circle, but you perceived uh, in memory and recall a blue square. And so the Treisman and Schmidt experiment was looking at sort of this idea where you have a series of uh, shapes and, and numbers and objects. And the idea is, um, so you have these, you know, four shapes and then two numbers. And then the question is, is, you know, are you going to be able to remember what you saw? And so, and I'll give you guys, uh, I'll show you guys an example of one of these particular um, experiments. So here would be the example. So a red triangle, you see this blue outline triangle, a yellow circle, and then a green outline of a, uh, uh, outline of a green circle. And so on the sides of it, it's the one and the eight. And so... With this particular experiment, which is specifically looking at illusory conjunctions, right? And what's important here is that they did follow it with a mask in order to um, avoid any sort of iconic, iconic memory, um, that last little bit of visual memory that kind of sticks with us. They didn't want that to 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 over to have an effect afterward, an over effect. So they um, would would briefly show. Um, the they would briefly show this picture here and then they would ma do a mask so that you couldn't have that residual image on there but the task was that you had to report the numbers first so here you would report 1 and 8 after this disappeared very quickly and then you would need to uh report the shapes at four locations so this was not an easy task and this is something that you know even thinking back now can you remember the shapes the numbers were one and eight but do you remember the shapes and where they were in space and so in this particular experiment they found that um the uh the participants um incorrectly uh uh uh, called out the features with the objects about 18% of the time. Um, and when they switched the instructions to the participants to tell them to focus on the objects versus the numbers, they found that that 18% went away. And so they were able to get people to more accurately <clears throat> remember the placement of the shapes. So 18% of the time they may say, oh, I think I saw a blue triangle on the lower right corner. I think I saw a green circle with, you know, uh, that was solid and, and things like that. Now, <clears throat> with balance syndrome, this is a particular very interesting kind of um, syndrome where we can actually test patients in a particular way. So this is parietal lobe damage. And because um, we see a lack of this focused attention, so this right here would be next to impossible for a, a, a patient with, uh, with balance syndrome to do. We're seeing them actually make these mistakes very often. We see these incorrect combinations of features and it actually provides us with evidence for the feature integration theory because it's telling us that they're able to do this pre-attentive stage, but they're not able to do the next step, which is the actual focused attention. So with balance syndrome, we see that this, um, this effect happens quite a bit where they're not able to integrate those features correctly in. Now, so this is these are examples of focused attention. These are examples of us saying, okay, I'm going to pay attention to this thing, or you're told to pay attention to what thing. Now, what happens when we don't attend to something, when we don't pay attention, when we're uh, not specifically focused on a particular thing? What happens is something called inattentional blindness. Now, inattentional blindness happens when you there's something that's right in front of your face, clearly visible, but you're not directing your attention to it, therefore you miss it. You're not attending to it. Now, there are different versions of this. We can actually have an intentional deafness where somebody's calling out our name and we completely don't even realize that they're calling out our name. 
Um, and so what ends up happening is that, of course, you uh, don't hear them. Um, inattentional blindness is the same idea. Something happens right in front of your face and you don't see it. Um, and we've got a couple of different examples of this um, where we can, um, there's a video that I have for you guys where um, I, you know, I'd really like for you to, to actually see it um, because <clears throat> it's something that's really interesting. Uh, you might have actually seen it before, um, but I, I kind of want to bring this to your attention. But before we go into that video, um, what I want to do is kind of bring your attention to uh, uh, one of the uh, sort of classical experiments that has been done on um, inattentional blindness. And so <clears throat> what a person uh, was asked to do in this particular experiment. So this, uh, this is displayed in five trials. So uh, A represents trials one through five. And so uh, in the trial, the arm of the cross is just slightly longer on each trial. And the person is supposed to indicate which line, either the horizontal line or the vertical line, is longer. So through one through five, that's what they're doing. They're choosing vertical line or horizontal line, which is longer. On the sixth trial, which is represented by B, they um, are doing the same task, but in this example, there's a little square that pops up. Um, and so when you're doing this task, you're pretty focused. You're staring at the line. You're trying to see which one's longer. As you can see here, compared to this one, to this one, the... Um, you know, this, the, the vertical line is, is longer in this case, right? So when you're looking at this and you're really focused, you're staring at this, you're like, okay, which is longer, which is longer, this pops up and the subjects are asked, did you notice anything different on this trial? And, you know, they are very likely to, to miss um, that they even saw anything odd. So out of 20 participants, only two will actually notice the square. It's right in front of them. It's flashed in front of them, um, but they completely miss it. They're blind to it, even though it's located right in their line of vision and right where they're seeing. And so this is something that we see a lot of times happening where we are essentially blind to something right in front of us. So what I'd like for you to do is I want you to just pause this video and I want you to play this one because I'm gonna give some stuff away and I don't want you to, um, I, I want you to watch it. And I don't want you to miss what's going on here. So I'm gonna give you a moment to just pause this video and then I want you to watch this YouTube video and then I want you to come back to this. So I'm gonna give you a second to do that. So hopefully you paused it and you came back. And what I want to do is now kind of go over this particular one. This is a really neat one. Um, this is one that's used um, a lot in examples. And so something that you may have noticed or not noticed, um, especially if you know to look for it, is that there is a gorilla that actually came in um, in the middle of this video. So they're passing the ball back and forth. Your job is to count the passes. You're looking at the ones in a particular color. You're staring at it. And so because your attention is focused, you miss something that's right in front of you. So not only did you miss the gorilla, but a lot of times, and I really like this video because this is additional change, it, you very likely miss the curtain change and the fact that one of the players left the, the, the screen. Um, I like this one because if you know that the gorilla or something weird's about to happen, you tend to miss the curtain change because again, it's something that you're that you're not um, expecting. Um, but it happens right in front of you. This is another traditional one where the gorilla walks right in the middle. Um, about fifty percent of people tend to miss this um, when they're watching the video, um, and it's just a really interesting. Uh, example of how we can be inattentionally blind. If we're not paying attention to something, then that is something that's going to happen right in front of us and we completely ignore it. Now, I also want you to take a look at this one. So I'm going to give you a moment to, to look at this one. Um, and this is a really interesting uh, little snippet of <clears throat> uh, a change blindness. So I'm going to give you a second to stop this video and then start that one and then we'll come back. So hopefully you had a chance to watch that video. Um, and now let's talk about change blindness. So change blindness, um, 
it, it, you know, you, you think, oh, I would notice, I would notice something happening right in front of me. I would notice something changing. Um, this is typically uh, done in an experiment form with uh, a picture that looks very similar to another picture. And the idea is, is that you need to see where is, where's the difference. Um, so the pictures almost look identical when you first look at them. It, when, you know, when you were younger, you might've done this with the newspaper the, or like a puzzle book. A lot of times they'll say, okay, how many um, changes can you circle that you notice from this picture to that picture? Um, and so when you show the one picture and then switch to the next picture and say, do you notice a change? People very often don't notice even very big changes. They're very blind to these changes. Um, and you have to kind of flip back and forth. Now, if you add a cue to show where around the area the um, changes, people get very good at it. If you tell them around the area, then they look for that area and they attend to it and they're able to, to see the difference in the next picture. But it's something that um, is hard to do when it's right in front of you. And so we also see this in um, film shots. We see this in continuity errors in TV, in TV and in movies. Um, you can see this, for example, in um, one of the Harry Potter movies. I believe it was the Sorcerer's Stone. Um, Harry's sitting at the din at, at the table eating and suddenly he's like in a different position. Um, a lot of times uh, we see this in movies like The Wizard of Oz and um, Dorothy's hair is at different lengths throughout the movie. And it's something that we don't really pay attention to. It's only when it's pointed out to us that we actually see this. And we're very often are blind to these different changes. Um, and we... When we're looking at um, objects in the environment, um, you know, we don't really experience change blindness because of movement. Um, but we can even kind of notice this sometimes. Uh, there are sometimes things that happen that we don't notice that's right in front of us, even in real time, non-videos, non-TV, right in front of us. And an example of this is sometimes when... Uh, for example, you're eating in a restaurant and you might have a waitress or a waiter who's waiting on you and then somebody else comes and takes your order and you actually don't even realize that the person's changed. Um, that can happen. And again, it's a lot of times we're not attending to it, so we're not paying attention to the person you know, very clearly and so that can happen. But change blindness occurs a lot of times looking at pictures. Um, so here... Uh, if you look at <clears throat> these pictures, just from, if you look at the original picture to the modified picture, if you just look from there to there, it's, it's very difficult, um, sometimes to kind of pick up on, on the change. Um, here, if you have a mask that directs your attention to this area of the picture, then it's easier to see that this is existing here and it's not existing here. Um, so, you know, when we are given cues, it's something that allows us to be better at picking up that particular change. Um, and again, subtle changes like margin, marginal interest, for example, just the reflection is missing. This is something that, you know, is harder for us to be able to pick up on. But when we are given some sort of cue of where to look, we're going to do better at actually picking that up. So that's just an example of, um, of change blindness. <clears throat> now, um, when we look at, um, actually, um, paying attention to particular scenes, one question that comes up is, do we actually have to pay focused attention? Um, and this is a particular experiment that was done to look at, um, in this case, the different kinds of, um, how quickly we're able to kind of pick up on different kinds of scenes. And so, uh, can we grab the gist of a scene, um, or do we need focused attention? And so <clears throat> in this particular experiment, uh, Lee did three, had, uh, 
subjects do three different tasks. They had the central task, okay, which is they had to determine determine if the letters in the center were all the same. So that would be, for example, looking here and seeing that this one is not the same. So there's T's and there's L's, right? So that's that's you know the the um, central task. Then there was the peripheral task, which was to look at the scene. Uh, there would be a the next scene would be here. Is that a male or female face? Okay. And there's an example of a polar bear here, but this is another um, a, a, another one of the um, stimuli. And then the dual task, which is now they have this right here, and they have to say, is it red green, or is it green red? And the idea is is that. When you are looking at <clears throat> these tasks, you know, so you still have to determine, are these letters all the same? Is it all T's or is there one L? What's going on here? Is this a face? Is it male or female? Or is it a disc? Is it red, green, green, red? And so the idea is, is that... Um, do you have to pay focused attention on this to be able to get the gist of the scene? Are you, you know, are you able to do this central task, have this peripheral task, right? Um, and, and still do it. And it turns out that yes, we can for faces. We're actually really good at that. We're good at animals and we're good at faces. Um, so we don't, this is a very automatic, very quick process where we don't really need focused attention on getting the gist of a scene if it contains a face. And we've talked about faces before where we're very quick, we're so quick that we almost, it's, it's effortless, right? But when it is not something that's like a face or an animal or something like that, when it's this, we have uh, actual task of red, green, green, red disc, this is very hard for us to do when we are doing a dual task. So in the case of this one, we're, um, participants were almost at 100% accuracy when they had to detect what was going on in the corner here, right? With the gist of the scene. But when it came to red, green, green, red, they only did about the level of chance of a guess of green, red, or red, green. So it turns out that Attention is necessary for perceiving certain scenes, but there are other things that we are very quick at being able to attend to. And that's something that, you know, we're able to do, uh, we, we, we're, but with more time and more work. So these kinds of things are things, these gists um, are things that we don't get, these scenes we don't get very quickly because they're not intuitive. So that gave us a lot of information about these kinds of, of um, scenes. But another um, kind of uh, question is, is what if we uh, distract the participant? And how much distraction is necessary? Um, can they still do a task? Um, and how, how does that work? So um, when it comes to attention, there are certain stimuli that we tend to... Uh, do as uh, as scientists to to put in which are called task irrelevant stimuli and so this is something that pops up as a distraction it's not relevant to the task at hand but often we want to see is the person able to detect that thing you know is that person able to see um that that stimuli that stimulus that's irrelevant to their task at hand and Forrester and Lavi did this experiment where they were testing their uh the the load theory of attention so we have two uh perceptual things here we have our perceptual capacity which is how much attention is needed to carry out a perceptual task okay so um the uh and this is just kind of a, a, a schematic, very simple, super, super simple schematic of perceptual capacity and perceptual load. So perceptual load is how much um, capacity we need to carry out a particular task, okay? Um, so a low load task will be one that doesn't need a lot of attention, something that you do a lot. For example, 
when you navigate through your phone. If you have had your phone for a while, you know where all your apps are, you know how to get onto Facebook, you've used Facebook before, you know, it's effortless for you to click through stuff. You can do that mindlessly. That is what we refer to as a low load task. It's something that doesn't require a lot of concentration and focus. Um, it's a very, you know, uh, it doesn't take up a lot of your capacity to do that task. Now, a high load uh, perceptual task would be one that you have to really concentrate on or you're really interested in. And that takes up more of your attention. It takes up a higher portion of your capacity. So here would be an example of your perceptual capacity um, here, okay? So we are, um, the idea is, is that this would be the perceptual load taken up by a low load primary task. You've got all this left over and that can be given to something else. That can be given to some other task that you can pay attention to. Okay, so you've got all this left over with this being something that requires not much of your attention and focus. This would be an example of a high primary task, high load primary task with either something that's very difficult that you're focused very, very strongly on or something very interesting and you've got nothing left. You've got nothing left um, to focus except for all of your attention is on that thing. No capacity remains. So um, this is, and this is something that <clears throat> we talk about a lot of times in terms of driving. <clears throat> now, driving is one of those things that we see, for example, people think this is, this is the problem with, with driving is that a lot of times people think um, that, you know, when, when it comes to driving, excuse me, that they are, this is their, uh, you know, their whole ca capacity. They think that driving might take them that, right? And they go, so the green is the um, load associated with driving and the blue is associated with everything you've got left over. And you're like, you know what? I got plenty. I can, um, I can read a book, <laughs> Believe it or not, I've seen people drive down the street reading a book. I can, um, you know, eat a sandwich. I can eat a taco. I can talk on the phone. I can do whatever because, um, you know, it doesn't require me, you know, this green here, this is the load that's needed to drive. And in reality, when we talk about driving, and this is the yellow here, driving is something that should take all of your attention because at any point, something can jump out at you, something can uh, distract you, and something can be you know right in front of you. So a lot of people think the, this one right here is where they're at, when in reality, they should focus all of their attention on driving. Um, it needs constant attention. So Strayer and Johnston did this um, very interesting uh, study on cell phone use and driving. And what they wanted to show was that um, anything that distracts you, even something like a hands-free headset, um, will distract you and potentially cause you to uh, have an accident. And so <clears throat> when it comes to driving a simulator, for example. Um, uh, Strayer and Johnston had participants uh, sit into a driving simulator and they wanted to see if the person had a cell phone, if they would, um, uh, um, if they would miss a red light, okay? Or if they, uh, and, and then how quickly it took them to break for each red light, okay? So as you can imagine, when a person doesn't have the cell phone, okay, they don't miss those lights, okay? Um, and then when they uh, are braking, they're very quick at braking for those red lights. So here, this is a very good reaction time, about 525 milliseconds to brake for a red light when you don't have a cell phone. So when you don't have a cell phone, you, you miss very, very few uh, red lights because you're paying attention. And then when you have a cell phone, um, what ends up happening is that, of course, you're much more likely to miss a red light. And 
um, for those red lights that you don't miss, it takes you this much longer to react. So, you know, it, it takes you um, up to almost 600 milliseconds. This difference here um, is, is enough to cause an accident. Um, and so with a cell phone, people are much more, uh, they're much slower to react and it's much more difficult for them um, just to, in terms of like catching things that they need to catch. We also find that when people use um, even hands-free headsets, um, what ends up happening is that they are distracted to the point where um, they're much more likely to either get into an accident or something as we call a near miss, which is almost an accident, um, but they're, you know, that they saved it in the end. Um, and so as cars today are getting new um, technology that's like, okay, well now you don't need to use a cell phone, you can use Bluetooth, um, you don't need to use your hands, you can just yell out commands, um, you can play uh, music at your fingertips instead of having to press buttons, you can yell out commands instead of having to press buttons. And the ideas behind that, they're great. But the problem is, is that it turns out it's not necessarily just the physical nature of, of the cell phone in your hand, of your hands off the wheel, of you pressing buttons, but it's, it's the fact that you're simply distracted and your eyes aren't on the road or that you're not paying 100% attention to what's in front of you. There was a colleague of mine who did some research in graduate school, very interesting research, looking at how we communicate to one another. So he was in more of a linguist, and he was interested in how we communicate with one another face-to-face -face versus on headsets. And so what he found is that when you're face-to-face, -face, so like a passenger in the car, your conversation and communication is actually very different than when you're on the phone, regardless if you have a phone in your hand, regardless if you have a, a headset. And so when you are in the car with somebody and you're having a conversation and there's something that happens in front of you, let's say there's construction, there's an accident, the traffic slows down, there's something that's going on, you're going to be much more likely, that person beside you is going to be much more likely to end the conversation or at least to uh, you know, pause it or to say, Ooh, what's going on? And they're not going to distract you while you're driving. Whereas if you're on the phone with somebody, regardless if it's a hands-free headset or not, that person doesn't know what's going on on your end. And so you're you've stopped talking because you want to pay attention to what's going on. You're, you're, you're paying closer focused attention. That person may still be talking and social rules tell us it's, it's rude to, you know, end it, to stop talking in the middle of a sentence. It's weird. It's odd. The person might be checking in. So you're driving and then you drop off maybe your sentence and the person's like, what's going on? What are you doing? Can you hear me? What's, you know, what, what, is there something going on? And what that does is it distracts you because now you've got to stop what you're doing and explain what's going on or say, I'm going to, I have to go or I, you know, whatever. And those are just crucial milliseconds that can mean, you know, an accident. It can mean slow reaction time. It can mean you getting into an accident. And so the uh, results of the experiment that my colleague did found that people who are talking face to face react differently to the conversation than when you are, you know, on a headset with somebody and you're distracted trying to do something that is outside of the conversation. And so <clears throat> when you are on the road, it's always important to make sure that you're giving your driving your full attention. Um, and the technology, technology today tries to allow us to be able to do things you know, with divided attention, but we've found that, of course, we as humans are just not able to give something our true focused attention and split things, you know, evenly in terms of our attention. It just makes us more distracted. So hopefully, um, that was something that you, uh, you know, um, found very interesting. And, um, this is the end of chapter six. So, uh, you guys can actually do <coughs> the next exam. Um, so if you have any questions about any of the material, of course, you can let me know. Um, I'm happy to answer any of that material in class or through email. Um, and uh, I hope you have um, a good night.